Whew. Sitting across from the fertility doctor in 2017, I am working hard to keep it together, fighting back tears as he's sharing with us that it's going to be very difficult to start our family. Even if we do IVF, we may still struggle. But in that moment, the one thing that helped me to keep it together, thinking about the fact that my mom and my sister started their family much later in life, naturally. So if they could do it, maybe I could too, right? Well, little did I know that was actually based on a lie. Fast forward to 2019 when I had the shock of a lifetime and learned that I wasn't the only one who struggled to start their family. My parents did as well and ultimately had to turn to don donor sperm, something I had no knowledge of until 41. <laughs> so at the age of 41, I learned that the father that raised me was not my biological father. You can imagine all the feelings that rushed over me. Shock, anger, sadness. The feeling like everything in my life had changed and yet nothing at all. It was incredibly difficult to learn, but here's the thing, it was not hard to believe. You see, my whole life I have felt like something was off, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Now, I wish I could talk to my father about this, but sadly, he passed away at the end of 2018 of a rare heart condition that actually had a genetic component and is the reason I took 23andMe. You see, I didn't think that 23andMe was going to tell me if I had his heart condition, but at that point in my life, any answers would be better than no answers. Little did I know I was going to get more questions than answers when a new first cousin popped up. <laughs> now that new first cousin led me to go ahead and take Ancestry.com, another DNA test, where this time a half-sister and grandmother made an appearance. <laughs> so with a first cousin, a half-sister, and a grandmother, it wasn't hard to put the pieces together, and my mom finally shared about their experience, and I was able to figure out who my biological father was. Now, interestingly, my biological father is quite active on social media, so I may or may not have slid into his DMs <laughs> on Instagram. <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> you know, I wanted to know my health history and if I had any other siblings out there. And he did not see that message for a month. It was a long month. But when he did see it, he responded in such a caring, loving, open way. You know, I'm one of the lucky ones. A lot of people in my situation are faced with silence or rejection. And I would have been devastated had that happened to me. Now, even though I am one of the lucky ones, it was still a tough road to recovery and forgiveness. But I actually think my fertility journey helped me to understand why my parents did what they did. You know, even today, there is so much misinformation and misconceptions out there. Imagine in the 70s when it was the Wild West of the fertility industry, right? And so I have put myself in my parents' shoes, and I really think there were some things they just didn't realize or they got wrong. You know, I can imagine my father thinking, if I just love her enough and give her a good enough life, it won't matter. How is it any different than a blood donation or an organ donation? Well, I'm here to tell you my parents did a wonderful job. They gave me an incredible life, a life that I feel very privileged to have had. They were really loving parents, and he was completely wrong. Half of my genetics came from a stranger. Look, I was a high school math teacher, so I definitely get the whole nature-nurture argument. I do think our environment plays a role in shaping who we are. But so do genetics, right? They impact how we look, how we think, how we act, and even according to 23andMe, whether or not you like cilantro. <laughs> now, let's see if this works. Take a look at this picture. 
and it's me and my biological father up there, the resemblance is uncanny, right? I got another one for you. I blame my mother for that haircut. <laughs> Now check out those ears. Oh, those ears were such a point of insecurity for me growing up. And if I would have known where those came from and had those mirrored back to me, I would have felt so different. And it's not just physical appearance. I am wired just like my biological father and even more spooky, like my biological grandmother. And you see, when you don't have that mirrored back to you when you're growing up, ultimately it left me feeling like a second-rate version of the people around me. Another thing I don't think my parents realized was that for 41 years, when I'd go to the doctor, I filled out the health history with lies. <laughs> you know, and the doctors ask you for a reason because our mental and physical health often have a genetic component. And when they don't have that information, it can be difficult to diagnose and to treat certain conditions. And I do think fertility clinics are trying to do better. I do. But here's the thing. Who's making sure that it's accurate? And even more so, when people donate, they're often in their 20s or 30s. A lot of health issues don't appear until you're much older. Who's making sure that information is going back to the fertility clinic? And even more so to the people that were created. Now, I mentioned that I was one of the lucky ones. I've gotten to meet my biological father and other relatives. He is larger than life and an incredible storyteller. And one of the first stories he shared with me was that when he went to uh, Washington University for med school in St. Louis, where I'm from, he was a poor med student. And so he donated <laughs> Monday, Wednesday, <laughs> Friday all through med school. <laughs> and even when he came back for his fellowship. <laughs> so think about that for a minute. I could have hundreds, maybe even thousands of siblings. I brace for impact every time I get an alert from Ancestry.com or 23andMe. Now, none have appeared yet, but the possibility is very real. Another story he shared with me is that when his daughter went to Wash U for undergrad, he said to her, don't date anyone that looks like you. <laughs> Could be your brother. <laughs> I laugh too, on the surface it's funny, right? But the reality is it's terrifying. I was single in St. Louis a long time. It is terrifying to think about dating a sibling. None of these things do I think my parents realized when they made that choice so long ago. And now I love my parents. I wouldn't tra trade my father for anyone. My father is my father, and they got a lot wrong. I have been on my fertility journey now for six years. So please hear me when I say, I truly want anyone who wants to have a family to be able to do so, but not at the expense of the kids they are created. I have now done 10 egg retrievals. After the 10th one, I definitely thought about using donor eggs. And we may have to turn that way, but we haven't yet. But if we do, there are definitely things I will do differently. And three most important to me, I've already alluded to. One, my child would know all three branches of their family tree. And when I say no, I mean have a relationship with their biological family, which is very triggering for a lot of people and would have been triggering to my father. But the, here's the thing we forget. Love is not a competition. More love is more love. You know, there's a phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. There's a reason for that, right? Our neighbors, our teachers, our coaches, our aunts, our uncles, our cousins, they all play a role in that child's life. Why not have that genetic parent in that life in the village with everyone else? Secondly, my child would have accurate health history their whole life, and mainly because they would know firsthand from their relationships 
with their genetic family and not have to rely on a fertility clinic to know what's going to happen in their health. And lastly, my child would have a manageable number of siblings <laughs> and wouldn't date one <laughs> and have a relationship with them throughout their life. Now, I know some of these concepts are a bit new for people and can feel overwhelming. But if you are thinking about starting your family this way, or already have, there are amazing resources out there. And I encourage you to look into them. The three that are my favorite are a Facebook group, good old social media, called Donor Conceive Best Practices and Connections. The second is a psychotherapist, Jana Rupnow. She specializes in donor-conceived and adoption issues. She has a book, a podcast, very active on social media. Jana Rupnow. And lastly, there is a nonprofit called U.S. Donor Conceived Council. And they are working tirelessly to educate and advocate for donor-conceived rights. And because of their hard work and the amazing legislators here in Colorado, I am proud to share that Colorado is the first state in the country to pass legislation supporting donor-conceived rights. Yes, yeah, <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> now this legislation is far from perfect, but it is a great first step and one that I hope other states will follow. Because here's the thing, two things can be true at the same time. People can start their families using donor eggs and donor sperm. And it can be done in a way that supports the rights of the children created. Thank you.